I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Bruce Stromberg. He is director of the Beckham uh, Laser Institute and the Medical Clinic at the University of California. Thank you, Professor. Okay, so um, we'll switch gears a little bit and maybe I can address one of the questions that was just coming up about how you might be able to do dosimetry over a spatially varying area, spatially and temporally varying area with these techniques. Um, so if uh, you recall the last time uh, I talked about basic concepts behind doing spectroscopy and tissue optics, um, and now this lecture will focus uh, really on measurement technologies, how we actually build the instruments, get the data, analyze the data, and we'll begin to get into some examples of real-time metabolism and physiology that we can measure. So uh, just as a kind of a review, um, here is a, a, t a temporal frequency domain instrument. Uh, we modulate light in time. And let's see if I can get my animation to work. So this results in uh, launching of a diffuse photon density wave into tissue. This propagates with a phase velocity that's different than the velocity of light. Um, we measure the change in phase and the change in amplitude as a function of frequency. We compare that to a theoretical response that comes from a model that originally is the transport equation, but we'll make approximations to the transport equation in order to solve that analytically. So we usually use a diffusion approximation. So this is a real-time calculation. Uh, here, we're typically limited in terms of our source colors, the source wavelengths, to diode lasers that are available. So we may use a 660, uh, 780, and 800, and 850. So there are only certain wavelengths that are available commercially. We don't build our own diode lasers. Um, and this is what the data will look like. So as I mentioned, we measure phase, and we measure amplitude as a function of frequency. And the important thing to pick out if you're really paying attention to this, this slide is that there's some nonlinearity to the phase and the amplitude as a function of frequency. That nonlinearity is something that we're hoping to achieve when we make our measurements. So we need to move to frequencies that are sufficiently high so that we're equal to the reciprocal of the re absorption relaxation time. So remember we talked about absorption lengths. If you divide by the velocity of light, you have time. Time and frequency are equivalent to each other. So if we go to a frequency that's sufficiently high, that we're approximately at the absorption relaxation times, then we're going to see dispersion in the photon density wave. And dispersion in a scalar density wave is the same as dispersion in a typical optical wave. It's nonlinear dependence of the velocity of the wave on frequency. So that's what we're after. If we can see that dispersion and we do these fits, then we can actually get very nice optical properties from the tissue. Now, as I mentioned before, we are kind of constrained to the optical, to the, the lasers that we're able to use. So we can make absorption and scattering measurements at specific optical wavelengths. So for example, we'll have a laser here, we'll have a laser here, a laser here, and so forth. But that doesn't look very much like an absorption spectrum. That's not a fingerprint spectrum. How do we fill in all of the wavelengths in between? We would like to get that information. Should we just try to build hundreds of lasers, or should we just use maybe a super continuum source and get all the wavelengths? I mean, that's one possibility. But we're trying to develop very inexpensive portable instruments that can be brought into the clinic. So one way to do this, and this is a common technique that's done in inverse problems, we take our frequency domain side, FDPM stands for Frequency Domain Photon Migration. So we take our frequency domain laser diode side and we measure the mu sub s prime as a function of wavelength. And then we constrain that to look like me scattering behavior. And if you recall from the first lecture, I talked about how when the optical wavelengths are sufficiently long and the particles in the tissue are approximately the order of the dimension of the optical wavelength, then that's a valid approximation. So there's really no structure to this. It falls off as a lambda to the minus b. And so we simply fit the measured scattered points to that behavior. And now we have the ability to potentially constrain a measurement with broadband non-modulated light. So what we do 
is we combine this measurement with DC reflectance. So we add to our system a white light source and a spectrometer, and we measure simply the DC diffuse reflectance. Now the DC reflectance, if you use that technique, it's a good technique, it's very sensitive. However, it's not quantitative. It's very difficult to calibrate DC techniques. You're very subject to, con if it's a fiber-based technique, the quality of contact between the fiber and the tissue, angular changes, uh, Num there are just many, many things, pressure changes, lots of fluctuations potentially in DC measurements. But now we've actually got a ground truth with the tissue, the wavelength dependence of scattering, and we can convolve that with the DC diffuse reflectance, and then we can calculate the absorption and the scattering in every location that we put our probe. So here's just an example, and I'll come back to this in the third lecture, of scanning over breast tissue and here we're actually, there's a tumor beneath the surface. This is a little over a one centimeter diameter tumor in a young woman. And you can see wherever we put the probe, and this is just a grid pattern that we put our probe on, and the source detector separation is three centimeters. So the presence of the tumor beneath the surface will perturb the spectra. So we get a spectrum in every location. You can see in the location right here where there's the brightest spot, we see a spectrum that looks like this, where there's a water peak and a lipid peak that are approximately equal to each other. There's A. And then in B, a more normal looking region, we see a higher uh, water peak and uh, um, a lower lipid peak in this region C, uh, which is entirely normal looking. Uh, then we see an even higher lipid peak, uh, indicative of more normal tissue. We have hemoglobin peaks over here, and you can see the scattering changes also as a function of location. So the important thing to get from this is that in every location we put our probe, we can get a different fingerprint absorption and scattering spectrum. From those spectra, we can calculate any of these components, oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, total hemoglobin, saturation, and so forth. If you have a sensitizer in there, you could calculate that as well if you, have, if you know what its extinction coefficient is. And then you can make a map. You can actually make an image of the subsurface constituents. So that's part of the technique that allows you to detect tumors and look at how tumors respond to chemotherapy. And I'll talk more about that really in the third lecture. In spatial frequency domain, if you recall, what we do is we take a digital light projector or a spatial light modulator. You can get a developer's kit. Um, and you can use your own sources. You can also get a digital light projector and take the sources out and just shoot your own laser or your own LEDs into it. And we change the projection pattern. We can change the color of the light either by programming the projector. You know, the projectors are RGB projectors. They have LEDs that are of specific colors. And you can actually program it all on PowerPoint. It's a very simple way. That's the least expensive way to do it. So we project these sinusoidally modulated patterns, spatially varying patterns on the tissue, and we'll project them at different phases. So we need to retard or change the phase of the projection by 120 degrees so that we can do a demodulation. The demodulation is important, and we use the same demodulation expressions that are used in structured light microscopy, where we look at the differences between the phase projections. And that allows us to see, form an image of something that's at the surface and beneath the surface. So the implication of this, and let's look a little bit more deeply at how this technique works, is that at different frequencies, there's different penetrance into the tissue. So tissue is a low-pass spatial filter. If we modulate at very low frequency, that actually goes deeper, the mean penetration depth. And these are simulations of light structured, propagating into the tissue. And the structured wave wavelength is actually very long. It's not like optical waves. So this is maybe um, 0.1 per millimeter, 0.05 per millimeter or so. So they're fairly long. They're visible. And I'll show you some examples of this. And they penetrate more deeply if they're low frequencies than if they're higher frequencies. Higher frequencies have much more superficial penetrance. One way to think about this, I know it's kind of tough in the frequency domain, if you just sort of do the transform in your head and go back into the real domain, if you have a source fiber and a detector fiber that are very far apart, 
then the average penetrance is much deeper than if I bring that detector fiber very close to my source. So when it's close to the source, then I'm looking more superficially. When it's far away from the source, I'm looking deeper. Now that's a great measurement if you just have a single point fiber, but as we've seen, single point fibers are sometimes not enough. We want to get an entire image. So this is a way of taking those point measurements and transforming it into image space. So you project these patterns over an entire field of view, and then you can calculate absorption and scattering in every pixel. So how do we do that? Well, we change the frequency, and we change the phase, and the different frequencies, so this is the measured fluence rate. At a low frequency, you'll see it decays more deeply. At higher frequencies, we'll see that the decay drops off faster. And then if we just measure the frequency dependent reflectance and we fit that to a model, then we can calculate the absorption and the scattering coefficients, just like we did in the temporal frequency domain. So in the temporal frequency domain, if you recall, we had the phase and the amplitude, and there was a little bit of nonlinearity to that. We had a nonlinear model. We fit the data to the model, and we're able to separate absorption from scattering. The same thing holds true here. We're measuring the reflectance as a function of frequency, and we need to have this nonlinear behavior. If we can get just enough nonlinearity, we fit it to the model, and we get very good fits, good re resolution or separation between the two. So the implications of this are, first, we can map the optical properties in space, and second, that we can do depth-resolved imaging, because, as you can imagine, if some frequencies are very superficial and some frequencies are very deeply penetrating, then if you're clever enough, you might actually be able to resolve things in depth. So let's just walk through uh, an example of a measurement. And uh, this is uh, one of my former grad students, Aman Mazar. So, and in a violation, I guess, of confidentiality, that is Aman's wrist. So here's Aman's wrist just with color light photography. Just you can see the reflectance. Here it is with near infrared illumination. Uh, you see already that there's different contrast than you see with uh, just a color picture. Now, here are the projections at different frequencies. So you can see. Here is zero frequency or DC projection. Here are the lines projected on his wrist at different frequencies. This is the demodulated diffuse reflectance, and you can see the demodulation image changes as we change the frequency because of the sensitivity uh, to different things. And then here is an absorption map and a scattering map of his wrist. So as we go to higher frequencies, because the light is not penetrating as deeply, essentially, we're looking at shorter path interactions or dominated by shorter path interactions. So we have decreased absorption contrast as we go to higher frequencies and a little bit more uh, heavily influenced by the scattering. And then now we've done a scatter corrected map of absorption. So we can use Beer's law, take the absorption coefficients at different wavelengths. And now we can make a map of oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, total hemoglobin, and saturation. If we have enough wavelengths, we can map other constituents. Let's say you have a sensitizer that absorbs in that region. You can also, in principle, make a map of its concentration. So we can also do this in fluorescence mode. Uh, so here's an example of how the power of the technique in fluorescence. So these are four tubes that are buried beneath the surface. They're a half millimeter in diameter. They have IR700 dye in them. So this tube is four millimeters deep. This tube is uh, one millimeter deep. Here is the real-time projection pattern. So you can see how the frequencies are changing. Um, they're also shifting in phase. And as we go to higher and higher frequencies, the deeper tubes become invisible. So let me see if I can freeze it up. Oh. Let's just run that one more time. So if you go to higher and higher frequencies, This is uh, higher frequencies. You, you start to see really strong information content coming from the most superficial tube. Uh, all the deeper tubes are beginning to be blocked out. And as you go to the highest frequencies, really the deeper tubes begin to totally disappear. And, and the reason for this is, if you think of my first lecture, this is optical path length control. So at a single wavelength of projection, a single optical wavelength, we're changing the modulation wavelength. 
and getting the same effect that you would get if you change the optical wavelength. So it introduces another element of power or control to your technique that allows you to get information content out of your system. So you can imagine if you're, if you're doing tomography, you might be able to take advantage of this information content and form 3D images of subsurface structures. So one approach to this is to do DOT, diffuse optical tomography, and there are many different techniques for DOT. One of them that we like that's very fast, actually the reconstructions are, are in tens of seconds or less than a minute, is an analytical approach where we solve a scattering integral and we use a, a perturbation approximation called the Reithoff or the Born uh, uh, perturbation approximation. And we can invert this integral and actually solve for the optical properties in space. So what's nice about this, John Shotland uh, and Soren Konecki introduced this. Uh, it's naturally solved in the frequency domain, and uh, there have been a number of uh, publications on this algorithm. So it's, it's, very, it's potentially very powerful. Um, it has disadvantages, of course. All of these techniques have disadvantages, but here's just a, an example of how it works. So here, let's take uh, the case. Here are two tubes that are pretty close together, um, and they have a floor four in them and if I, they're buried three millimeters beneath the surface. So when I look at the DC fluorescence at the surface, uh, I can't tell them apart. They're blurry. It looks just like one tube. That's because the fluorescence is excited. It scatters multiply, both at the source end and at the emission end. So it looks like there's just one tube. But if we actually take multi-frequency data on this, and now here's a fly-through, we can get, as a function of depth, the intensity of each of the tubes, and we can resolve those two tubes. Now, that's kind of the simplest case, but it, it's, it shows what the potential of this approach is, and then we can reconstruct those two individual tubes in three dimensions. And so we've applied this. Actually, this work was inspired by Brian's visit uh, when he came and gave the Osseroff lecture to the, in the Beckman Laser Institute. Um, so here, what we've done is we've taken an, a glioma model, uh, 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 glioma spheroids, and implanted them in a mouse brain uh, to simulate um, the type of situation that a surgeon might encounter if they're doing surgical resection of glioma. So this animal has also received uh, ALA, which converts into protoporphyrin 9. And so we'll be trying to image the fluorescence of these uh, glioma or these spheroids beneath the surface of the, s the skull, actually deep into the brain, a few millimeters into the brain. So what we're able to do then is project our spatial frequency patterns and get the absorption and the scattering at both the excitation wavelength and the emission wavelength, plus a few additional wavelengths. And here is just the planar fluorescence view. These are the eyes of the mouse. Here's just the skull, the picture of the animal with the skull intact. Uh, so the face forward is here. And you can see the planar fluorescence image of the tumor beneath the surface. What's kind of interesting is that we can also see in the MUSA-BES prime images the perturbation of the tumor. We can actually see a little bit of the scattering change. And these are the oxy and the deoxy hemoglobin images. So if you recall, again, in my first lecture, I said that it's important if you're doing fluorescence to try to correct for the intrinsic optical properties because they can distort your fluorescent signal. So you can think of this as a way of correcting for the intrinsic optical properties to unravel that distortion. And so here is the fluorescence tomography. And at a half a millimeter beneath the surface of the skull, we don't see anything. But our fluorescent tumor becomes more and more visible as we go into different planes beneath the surface. So it looks like it's peaking somewhere between one and a half and two millimeters beneath the surface. And then as we go deeper, it disappears. Now, the surgeons who are doing the resection don't need to go five millimeters at a, t at a time. They really only need to be able to see things a few millimeters in depth at a time. So potentially, this might be a way to have a wide field, non-contact approach for guiding surgery. And some of the, the problems with tomography are Many of the approaches require lots of computation time for solving this inverse problem. But using these types of analytical approaches with these scattering integrals, uh, they can be reconstructed in potentially in near real time. We're doing it on desktops in less than a minute. So you can imagine that if you parallelize that, you could potentially do these types of things in real time. <coughs> 
Okay, let's uh, sort of, in continuing along in the, the types of things that we're looking at, the natural implication is then can we look at dynamic physiology in tissues? Can we see oxygen utilization and consumption? And, and this is kind of my personal view of biology. Um, it's, uh, for me, everything that's important, it really is a roadmap that encompasses uh, what, what I think are the most important problems, uh, both in disease and in normal healthy tissue. In a sense, what this is, is uh, bioeconomics. It's uh, supply and demand. It's the balance between supply and demand. And many diseases, in fact, you could argue that all of them actually are a consequence of alterations in this uh, very uh, delicate balance that we all are trying to maintain. So first of all, the supply is coming from the vascular side. Uh, we have about 90 millimeters of uh, pressure of oxygen on the arterial side. And then in the cellular side, where the demand is, if we sort of drill down a little further, that demand is coming from mitochondria, where there's a demand for oxygen and a demand for glucose in order to produce ATP. So alterations in cellular function, uh, starting in mitochondria, in complete combustion of, of fuels, alterations in mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial diseases, uh, the creation of reactive oxygen species that may influence the activity of mitochondria, these can all influence the cellular demand side. And that leads into a feedback and a decline when the demand changes, either it increases or decreases, it can lead to alterations that can potentially be permanent on the vascular side. So just some examples in Alzheimer's disease, um, there may be alterations in the production of, of certain proteins. Um, so you'll see beta amyloid, you'll see plaques and tangles uh, that influence then cellular metabolism. Uh, over time, that may alter the ability of the vasculature to supply nutrients to the brain. And there's this complex spiraling, decaying pathway associated with loss of cellular demand and inability of the vascular supply to meet that demand. Another well-known example is in diabetes, where this may start at the cellular side with insufficient production of molecules to be able to degrade or help us utilize glucose, such as insulin. That leads in turn to elevated glucose concentrations in the extravascular, extracellular space. The body being a complex chemistry set decides that it needs to put water into that space in order to equalize the osmolarity of the tissue. So as water extravasates from the vascular side and fills up that extravascular, extracellular space, you start to get accumulation of water in the compartment of the tissue, which causes increased pressure, and it changes the ability of the vasculature to deliver nutrients over time. In fact, with this extravasation of water and the increased pressure, you get increased vascular permeability changes over time, and the, and the blood vessels literally cannot react quickly enough. In fact, they lose all of their reactivity over time, and they start to become very leaky, they don't meet that oxygen demand. And you see this, for example, in diabetic retinopathies, where patients begin to lose their vision because of these very dramatic alterations in vasculature. You see it in peripheral neuropathies. So diabetes is kind of a classic example of this spiraling cascade of alterations in cellular demand and alterations in the ability of the vasculature to supply. So all of these techniques that we're talking about, all these optical methods, are exquisitely sensitive to this overall uh, picture of measuring the impact of cellular demand of oxygen and how the vasculature adjusts to be able to supply that demand. So here's one example of a perturbation where we can kind of visualize this, we can test this in an individual. Um, so here's Aman again and uh, his, his wrist. And here we're going to put a cuff, a blood pressure cuff, uh, on his arm and occlude the brachial artery. So we're going to increase the pressure on the cuff sufficiently high so that we have full arterial occlusion, so well over 200 millimeters of mercury. It's a little bit painful, um, but Tim can tell you all about the pain. He actually worked in my lab as an undergrad and probably has the world's record on the number of occlusions experienced by any person. Uh, and he still seems to be okay. So. What happens is, with the occlusion, 
there's no blood flowing in the compartment and there's no blood coming out of the compartment. So what's his wrist going to look like? So these are the images of oxyhemoglobin on the left and deoxyhemoglobin on the right. Here's where the occlusion starts. Here's where the occlusion is released. And on the x-axis axis we have time. So this is, we, we're speeding this up a little bit because we don't have enough time in my lecture to show you the real time. But what you see in the, in the, in the blue um, is an increase in the deoxyhemoglobin content. And in the red is a decrease in the oxyhemoglobin. And the reason why you see that is because there's metabolism going on in the cells. They're pulling oxygen off of this pool of static blood. They need the oxygen in order to continue to be alive. So these rates of change of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin are characteristic of a mons tissue. That is a unique signature to him. So that's the first piece of information content. That rate of oxygen consumption is actually a unique signature for each individual. And then once the cuff is released, we see really interesting dynamics. So you see a drop, and then we'll see this drop, and then a relaxation down to baseline. But also notice in the drop or in the return, there's an overshoot. And let's see if I can maybe freeze it on that. So this is a very interesting change. Uh, we see here is the rate of oxygen consumption. We release the occlusion, and you see a rapid rise. And this rise involves an overshoot. So this difference, this delta hemoglobin concentration, is also that overshoot is characteristic of that individual. And it's telling us about that person's vascular reactivity. That overshoot is driven by the pressure that is returned into the system. The pressure drives the release of, uh, or the activation of a pathway that drives the release of nitric oxide that allows the endothelial cells to react, re relax the vasculature so that we're able to get more blood back in through the microvascular uh, uh, structures. So this overshoot is reflective of this vascular reactivity. And then there's a final phase that's quite interesting, and that's the re relaxation down to baseline. So you'll see the overshoot and then the relaxation. And the relaxation decay process is also reflective of the vascular reactivity. So we have three components in that very simple measurement that are potentially screens for individual vascular reacti reactivity. And if you have peripheral vascular disease, these, this, this entire time course, the delta hemoglobin, the rate of oxygen consumption, and the relaxation down to baseline will be very different. Here's another example of something that, uh, in particular, my colleague Tony Durkin has been working on. Um, and uh, he's very interested in, in flaps, uh, both free flaps during cancer surgery, um, as well as uh, uh, flaps uh, in plastic surgery uh, and reconstructive surgery. Uh, so here, this is a pig model at, with uh, an epigastric flap, a flap over uh, the belly. And here are two flaps. This is what the surgeon sees in an RGB image. Um, and what in this experiment, in the bottom flap, what they're doing is they have a little valve and they can control the amount of blood flow that's going into that flap. So they're gradually increasing the pressure on that valve. So they're reducing the flow going into that flap. So this is a device actually that um, a company that uh, another former grad student of mine started, David Kuchia, uh, called Modulated Imaging that's trying to standardize these technologies. Uh, in the laboratory, we, we use light projectors and they're not very nice looking and um, you know, they're not all standardized and, and they're difficult to convince physicians that they're okay to bring into an operating room. So, so David is working on ways to standardize these technologies so that they can be real medical devices. And so this is one of those prototypes imaging in this animal model. And you can see, first, if you just look at the image, uh, so this image corresponds to every one of these occlusion events. So here's a drop in oxygenation or saturation. Just to remind you, saturation is the ratio of oxyhemoglobin to the total hemoglobin. And that's 
a combination of arterial and venous components. It's not just the saturation that you typically see from a pulse oximeter, which is only arterial saturation. So this is the tissue saturation. And here's the first occlusion. It drops off a little bit. It's gradually increasing. And you can very quantitatively and, and precisely dial in the change in the flow and see the changes in the saturation in the tissue. And the image is quite striking. So you can see those oxygenation images very sensitively. And in principle, this is much more sensitive than just looking at it with a color camera or with your eyes. Everybody has different sensitivity in terms of their color vision. And what you may be able to do is use these changes that you quantitatively measure and are able to visualize during surgery as a way of predicting flap outcome, even while you're doing surgery. So if you think about it, you make a flap, and then you put it back into the tissue. The blood should come back in. It, everything should reanesthemose. And if it's not, then it will be necrotic. And if it's necrotic, then you have to go back and do surgery and somehow salvage that flap. So we want to prevent necrotic flaps, and we also want to follow people who've had flaps and have had them reattached. We want to follow them over time. So this is a good way during surgery to potentially look at the extent of oxygen, oxygen deprivation damage, as well as follow people over time to see if there is reanesthesis, reperfusion, and reinitiation of metabolism throughout that entire flap. The other thing to notice is that this is an imaging technique. And you'll see that there are spatial variations in the oxygenation signal. And those spatial variations have information content. And in fact, it is really the variation in oxygenation throughout the tissue that can be one of the most important features that can cause a flap failure. So here's uh, another system that we're looking at in terms of uh, oxygenation is an Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so we've been uh, uh, working with an Alzheimer's group that has a transgenic mouse model. And so we can take our spatial frequency domain imaging and image the brains of this uh, mouse model. And um, uh, it's not necessary to, to thin the skull. Uh, you can image right through the skull. So here is a control. Here's an Alzheimer's model. And I won't go, there's a lot of work that we've been doing in this area, looking at intrinsic properties um, and looking at dynamics, um, looking at evoked stimuli. But I'll show you kind of the simplest uh, experiment. So here's the control, here's the Alzheimer's, and we want to measure the vascular reactivity. Some standard ways to do this um, are to uh, change the inspired gas that uh, we're giving that animal during anesthesia. So here is just a, a simple hyperoxic challenge where we just increase the oxygen tension that the animal is receiving. And so this is what we see. So as we increase the oxyhemoglobin, or the oxygen tension, we see a dramatic rise in oxyhemoglobin. This is the image. And this is the dynamic plot, taking that as a region of interest. So we see it going up quite significantly. And here's what it looks like for the Alzheimer's animal, uh, a substantially reduced increase in oxyhemoglobin and a very different decay time. So we're in the process, actually, of building up this kind of information about how these animals respond to hyperoxia, hypercapnia, uh, evoked stimuli. And it's very clear that that picture of cell vascular coupling is altered. The vasculature does change in Alzheimer's disease. Many people, in fact most neuroscientists, really are very focused on looking at the cellular changes that are occurring in Alzheimer's, but there are also very significant vascular changes. And those vascular changes may be a way for us to detect the effects of Alzheimer's in patients earlier than we're currently detecting the disease. So they present a potential opportunity for us in optics because there are many optical methods that actually can probe directly into the brain, near infrared techniques, and look at these cell vascular coupling phenomena. Here's another example of a perturbation in the brain, and this is work that um, uh, we're doing with Ron Frostig, who's a neuroscientist, who 
was one of the first people to develop intrinsic signal optical imaging in the brain. And this is a, a pretty uh, powerful uh, stimulus that involves the injection of potassium chloride. So potassium chloride is injected here. This is a thinned skull um, in a rat. And we inject it over here. And these, all of these panels are showing the dynamic changes in all of the components that we can measure using spatial frequency domain imaging. What's interesting is here in this panel, this is the dynamic evolution of the scattering change in the tissue. And you see there's actually a scattering wave that propagates across the tissue. So what does potassium chloride do? It's, uh, it, it initiates a process called cortical spreading depression. So that's a slow-moving wave of depolarization that moves across the cortex. The high level of, of potassium in the extracellular space alters the concentration gradient of ions, both within the cell and outside the cell. And essentially, it stuns the neurons. So that stun, that depolarization, then results in a recovery but with the depolarization and recovery, there's a wave that spreads right across the cortex. Now, what's interesting is that this is a, a kind of a standard model for traumatic brain injury because what people believe is that following brain injury, there are a number of these events that occur over time. If you have lots of these spreading depression events, then it can lead to permanent neuronal damage. It's also the underlying mechanism, people believe, behind migraines. So when there are migraines, they're probably accompanied by this process of cortical spreading depression. So if you have migraines, this is what your brain looks like, uh, if you could actually image it um, with optical techniques. So the first thing to kind of see is we've got this wave of depolarization, um, and there are changes in scattering. The changes in scattering are most likely the result of the fact that with high pota uh, potassium concentrations in the extracellular space, alterations in calcium and sodium, there actually is water is driven out of the extracellular space and into the cells. So the cells begin to swell. And if they, they swell quite dramatically, and that swelling effectively dilutes the contribution to the light scattering that you would have from the subcellular organelles. So we see a reduction in the scattering. And that's a wave that propagates across the surface. And what's interesting is if I see, if I freeze this, so you can see the spatial variation in the scattering. You see this wave propagating. Now behind the wave, there has to be a change in metabolism. And so this is exactly what we see. Behind the wave, we see an increase in deoxyhemoglobin. And this occurs at the expense of oxyhemoglobin. So we see a drop in oxyhemoglobin. And this is a hallmark of the effect of that depolarization. That's the metabolic recovery that occurs as that wave propagates across the surface. So that's a pretty, that's like a hammer blow, a hammer perturbation to the brain. Uh, let me show you a more subtle perturbation. And this is used uh, very widely by neuroscientists. It's called intrinsic signal optical imaging. Um, typically, this is a rat model. Uh, we will thin the skull remove the skin and just thin the skull, but it's not necessary really to, to thin the skull in all cases. Um, and, and this is work, as I mentioned before, in collaboration with Ron Frostig. Uh, this was first described by Ron, um, Amiron Grinwald, uh, uh, Professor Wiesel, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, Torsten and Wiesel won, um, I mean, uh, Hubel and Wiesel uh, won the Nobel Prize for, being for elucidating uh, how the visual cortex worked. So Torsten Wiesel, in working with these guys with intrinsic signal optical imaging, they were able, with an optical experiment, to reproduce what it took them probably about a decade using electrodes. They, they reproduced all of that in a matter of months because you're able to do wide field imaging. So let me just kind of introduce you to how this method works. Um, basically, most neuroscientists will use one wavelength of light, 630, and they'll look at the reflectance at that wavelength, uh, as a difference between the reflectance, so they'll stimulate the brain in some way, they'll have a baseline reflectance, and so they just look at the difference between the reflectance during the stimulation and the baseline reflectance. And what, what do you actually see? Well, many of these uh, groups are stimulating whiskers, 
And whiskers have a very, very dense cortical representation. This is called the barrel cortex. So these are the cortical columns. These are barrels of multiple neur neurons. And they all are actually marked. They all can be registered with individual whiskers. So if you move one whisker, you can activate a single barrel in principle. And if you move a few whiskers, you can activate all of these barrels. And we can visualize that activation because if you think of cell vascular coupling, if the neurons are activated, the brain, remember, does not store glucose. So it needs glucose and oxygen in order to keep those neurons working. So if you activate the whisker, you activate the neurons, the neurons will call for vasculature to bring in blood and or oxygenated blood and glucose. So you'll see a perfusion change as you induce this metabolic perturbation. And that's exactly what they see. So this is the hemodynamic response, time, a time tracing of it, just looking at these differences in reflectance at 630. And then these are the images. So here is the image at about one second, and you can see that there's a darkened region over here. That's dark because there's more absorption of the 630 light. There's more absorption of the 630 because deoxyhemoglobin is produced very early on. There's a metabolic demand. Oxygen is being pulled off of oxyhemoglobin, and therefore deoxyhemoglobin is formed. And this, this, this is called, uh, in this community, the initial dip. So there's a dip where there's deoxyhemoglobin production, and that's this reduction in reflectance right in this barrel region. Now, the brain is, has uh, very complex autoregulatory processes. It does not like to have low oxygen tension, and it typically overcompensates for low oxygen tension situations. So as, as I think most of you know, neurons can't survive under low oxygen tension conditions for very long. So what the brain will do is it will reperfuse that region. That reperfusion, again, that's not a change in cardiac output. That's a local vasocontrol. So the brain will cause the blood vessels to expand in that region. And then we see reperfusion and and oxyhemoglobin, introduction of oxyhemoglobin to the site. So what does this look like when we're looking at reflectance at 630? There we'll see an increase in the reflectance because when oxyhemoglobin comes flooding back into the region, it dilutes the deoxyhemoglobin, which is kind of what we're most sensitive to with the 630. And so we see an increase in reflectance. And that goes up, and the typical time scale here is two to four seconds. That's the vascular time scale. And then, as in all of these dynamic systems, we see first this overshoot, and then a compensatory undershoot, and then a relaxation back down to baseline. And all of these time courses actually have information content. So that's a typical intrinsic signal optical imaging experiment. That's at one wavelength, and that's what most of the community does. So we're, of course, interested in many, many wavelengths, and we've been working with Tomas Tkasik at Rice to, to, to develop hyperspectral imaging techniques. And I won't go into the details of all of his hyperspectral imaging devices. They're actually, he has many, many different designs and they're, they're actually quite spectacular. But the bottom line is that um, we're able to get full images um, at about over 46 wavelengths, at about five hertz. So if we take this hyperspectral imaging camera in every frame, we're able to get 46 or so spectral bands. So that's in every frame. And we're doing this at about five hertz, so we can do the whisker stimulation, and we can take advantage of this multispectral information content. Now, if you recall, one of the interesting things about multispectral is that the optical path length can change by 20-fold over a spectral region going from visible to near infrared. And so we can take advantage of that and use that inverse scattering integral that I showed for the spatial frequency domain and apply that to the spectral frequency change and then localize this whisker perturbation at depth in space. So let me just show you what that looks like. So these are all different uh, panels of depth 
This is the change in the deoxyhemoglobin signal. This is the change in the oxyhemoglobin signal. And so this is a single whisker wiggling, and we're doing a tomographic reconstruction of the reflectance over all of these wavelengths and trying to localize where the perturbation is as a function of depth. And what we see is there's an increase in oxy and a decrease in the deoxy at about four to 500, 600 microns beneath the surface. So this is happening as a function of time. So we're plotting this as a function of time. And this is occurring roughly between two and four seconds. So, so that's the bold signal that we're looking at, the blood oxygenation level dependent contrast. So that's what's seen in fMRI, if you're familiar with that. What does fMRI do? It actually is looking indirectly at what goes on with deoxyhemoglobin dilution. So the bold signal, the same time course. However, when there's a di dilution of the deoxyhemoglobin as the oxyhemoglobin rushes into the region, then it changes the magnetization of the blood. And you'll see basically an increase in our T2 star relaxation time in the, in the MRI. So op optical techniques, are there any MRI physicists here? Okay, good, so we're among friends. Optical techniques are way better than MRI because we measure oxy and deoxy, and of course we can put in exogenous contrast and do many, many different things all simultaneously. I don't really completely believe that, but, it's, uh, <laughs> but I do optics. Okay, so let me just summarize now. Um, in terms of hemodynamic monitoring, optical techniques are highly sensitive to microvascular perfusion. Um, if you think of that picture, my picture of the universe of oxygen demand and oxygen supply, cellular oxygen consumption will drive this vascular supply. And typically we see the rates of oxyhemoglobin drop are, are comparable to the rate of deoxyhemoglobin formation. That can be altered in the case of certain diseases. Reperfusion is, uh, is telling us about vascular resistance and endothelial cell function. If there's high peripheral vascular resistance, then that reperfusion rate is, is heavily damped and the relaxation time is also significantly altered. And if we are able to correct for tissue scattering, um, we can see cellular effects as I showed during the cortical spreading depression and we can also use it to correct for path length changes uh, that may be important in doing tomography um, and in quantitatively assessing these oxy and deoxyhemoglobin fluctuations. And uh, that's it. Um, in my next lecture, just a little advertisement, um, we'll look at human studies, brain imaging, the impact of anesthesia on brain, uh, the impact of exercise on brain and muscle, and same techniques moving into cancer, how we can detect tumors, and look at how chemotherapy can perturb these types of metabolic parameters. So thanks very much. I wondered whether you'd like to comment on the resolution of your imaging technique compared to MRI, because I think it's a relevant number. <laughs> Particularly if you go 500, we, we were saying 500, 600 microns. Yeah, it? yeah. Well, you know, MRI can do that in 3D over the f all throughout the brain, and we're constrained to really looking in the cortex. Um, but uh, we're surprised to see resolution that's sub-millimeter with these methods, and so, you know, we're before we actually publish that data, we're, we're going through a very exhaustive review. Basically, I'm having one postdoc analyze it and then another postdoc analyze it. And, you know, but it, it's, uh, it's very encouraging. I, I think in, but in general, um, diffuse optical tomography, um, depending upon the geometry of the measurement um, and the model that you're using for solving this inverse problem, can give you resolution uh, on the order of about a millimeter but normally with fiber-based systems where you're looking very deep in tissue, uh, then the resolution is somewhere between five and 10 millimeters. So that's what most people are familiar with, but with these planar projection approaches, um, you're, you're only going three, four millimeters deep, uh, but your resolution will actually be better than those large volume interrogation approaches. Hey, um, in the images that you were showing of the wrist, um, imaging, you said that the that gradient of the response was indicative of his particular um, vascular response. 
I'm just curious how variant that is on, say, if you did on the other arm or just a little bit upstream on his arm. There's not been, it's, so these kinds of studies are, are um, hard to do in, term, in populations. We haven't done a lot of exploration on different sites. I can tell you that I know Tim has measured me and him um, on uh, uh, using a comparable technique looking in muscle. And um, it's pretty stable over time if we come back to roughly the same location um, and follow us out. Actually, we, we have months of year, probably a year worth of data. And we're pretty, we're, we're not quite as good as titanium dioxide phantoms, but we're pretty stable and, and reliable. There will be fluctuations, though, I'm sure, in metabolism. They may be a consequence of underlying spatial variations that could be, for example, in skin, reflective of the appearance of maybe skin cancer, actinic keratoses, alterations in the skin metabolism. Yeah, Tim's becoming a standard in our lab too now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lecture. Uh, I'm particularly interested in your distribution of optic properties on, on a two-dimensional surface, that kind of experiment. Uh, d would you be able to comment on the effect of the anatomical, you know, variations on your imaging results? Do you yeah. have a way of accounting for if there's a large change of, uh, you know, geometry uh, rather I than a flat surface? I think I might have a slide on that. So, um, what's uh, also happening is when you project these patterns of light onto irregular surfaces, then you see the patterns will actually curve. And you can, this is actually a fairly well established technique. If we change the orientation of the patterns, then we can actually calculate the curvature of the surface. And if we do a calibration to different heights, then we can unravel the effects of those fluctuations in the surface curvature, the irregularity. So for example, this is, uh, we do optical properties and profilometry, and then here's an uncorrected image, and here's now a corrected image of the absorption coefficient, and so you can get a much more homogeneous distribution. If you have really, really irregular stuff, like you work in very complex geometries, you, you might want to have multiple uh, 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 illuminators uh, coming in at, at a few different angles so that you can really cover, so you can compensate for shadows that may be introduced. Because obviously, if there's overhanging tissue and a shadow, there's actually, there is no reflectance. But I if there is reflectance that you can capture from irregular surfaces because of the structured light, um, that's a kind of a standard technique for surface profilometry. But y y you can actually use any profilometry device to capture that 3D surface topography and then account uh, for how that influences the optical properties. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, having no more time for questions, so let's thank again, Professor. <laughs>